All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the regional session. I'm Commissioner Jeff Barron, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, for the past four years, I've been trying to get to this session, uh, which everyone always raves about. I never managed to do it. Uh, so this year, uh, to make sure that I attended, I decided I would moderate. I volunteered, and they uh, agreed, so I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, one of the best things about this session is that there are no opening statements or long presentations. It'll be 100% Q&A uh, with the panel, so we can focus on the issues that you're most interested in. Uh, we'll be passing out cards uh, for your questions. As you think of questions, please fill them out and send them up. Uh, to get things started, I have some uh, pre-prepared questions, uh, but we're really counting on, on all of you to come up with um, questions to sustain a good discussion. Because it's a big panel, in most cases, I'll ask one of the regional administrators uh, to respond and then invite one of the licensee executives and our public interest panelists to weigh in if they have any thoughts on the topic. Uh, but other panels, feel free to jump in uh, with a different perspective or a brilliant point that they want to make. Let me start by uh, introducing our esteemed panel. First, our four regional administrators from our Region 1 office outside Philadelphia. We have Dave Liu. Uh, from Region 2 in Atlanta, we have Kathy Haney. Uh, Daryl Roberts is here from our Region 3 office outside of Chicago. And Scott Morris is our Region 4 administrator from Arlington, Texas. Uh, we are also lucky to have executives from two of our licensees joining us, Duke's Chief Nuclear Officer, Preston Gillespie, and Tim Powell, President and Chief Executive Officer of the South Texas Project Nuclear Operating Company. Rounding out the panel, we have Dave Lockbaum, uh, independent safety expert who until recently was the Director of the Nuclear Safety Project at the Union of Concerned Scientists. I know we're all looking forward to hearing a range of views on various topics, so let's just dive right in with the first question and get started. Um, first topic, first question, uh, relates to trends and in inspection findings. Since 2015, the number of nationwide inspection findings has declined from 821 per year to 457 per year. That's a 44% decline. All four regions have seen this trend in inspection findings. What do you think is driving the significant decline in inspection findings? Has the threshold for more than minor findings increased? And do you see this as a positive or negative trend? Maybe we'll start with Scott Morris. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so this was one of the pre-prepared questions. Um, and uh, in anticipation that many of folks would, would be interested in, in a response. And so I want to give you my perspective. Um, and I would invite my colleagues and others to, to, to chime in as they feel appropriate. I, you know, I think um, I have a number of thoughts about this. You know, it, it's true the number of findings overall has gone down. The bulk of those are white findings, as you would expect, or I mean, yeah, green findings, as you might expect. White findings and above um, have tended to be pretty stable in terms of uh, over the years. There's no, no substantive trend. But when you look at the green findings, there clearly has been a, a, a reduction. And I think you can attribute that to a, a number of things, but not the least of which is the fact that we as an agency, and when I was the d director for DERS, which is now uh, in the good hands of Chris Miller in NRR, um, we took a hard look at this. Uh, and admittedly prompted by the fact that we had some external auditors take a look at our program, GAO in particular um, issued a report about the, uh, the range or the, the uh, I guess the inequity of the number of findings across the four regions. <clears throat> and, and it prompted us uh, to look into that, uh, and we did. We did quite a bit of work on that survey-wise, et cetera. And ultimately what we concluded was um, that the, the real issue that was driving the disparity was how the different di regions interpreted the uh, minor, more than minor uh, criteria. Whereas one region might be presented a set of facts, would reach one conclusion about whether a particular issue found f would be, would be uh, considered minor. Another region presented with that same fact pattern might reach a different conclusion. <clears throat> in my region in particular, has been, uh, I hesitate to use the word outlier, but certainly for the last several years, it's been the highest uh, in terms of per unit, in terms of find, green findings. Now, it, those numbers all have gone down, which the commissioner mentioned. Uh, and again, I think the, the reason is in part because of the actions we took 
starting uh, at the program office level a few years ago, but continuing to resonate throughout the industry th through leader senior leadership discussions down to our first line supervisors and ultimately to our inspectors in the field about really, really asking themselves about um, whether or not something is in fact m should be considered minor or not. And I just think by simply shining a light on that when we, when our folks raise issues has caused that added level of consideration and, and subsequent interactions that they have with their supervisors to, you know, um, to, to start to drive those numbers down. And I think we've seen that. I, I also want to give credit to the industry too. I, I don't have hard data on this, but it, I think it's, it's fair to say that there have been a lot of modifications made to facilities, uh, hardware, equipment, components, programmatically that have continued to drive risk down so that when issues do arise and they get evaluated, their overall risk numbers are, are down because the plant is uh, the issue less risk significant because of some of the changes that are made. So I think it's a combination of us focusing more on the issue, making it, making the, con having a much more robust conversation about what is minor or what is more than minor, the, the cross-regional discussions we've had at senior leadership levels all the way down in counterpart meetings, et cetera. It's shining that light in combination with the safety enhancements that have made at the plants. I think ultimately that's what's the result of what's driving it. So. Okay. Tim, do you have thoughts on this one? Yes, I do. Uh, I appreciate Scott talking about our improved performance. That is, what to me, one of the key. The industry has worked very hard at improving overall performance. We've done a good job. There is a EPRI study that came out that shows that over the past five years, the core damage frequency has improved over that time period. And that improved performance, along with the maturity of the reactor oversight process, has helped to improve the differentiation between the minor and more than minor issues. And I think that was really driving the decrease in the numbers more than anything else. And uh, there were some that asked whether or not we saw this as a uh, change in how the inspections were being performed, and I have not. The inspectors are just as diligent as they always have been. They show up and do the entrances, a very thorough inspection, and then the exits. What I have just noticed is a change in the conversation on the uh, driver behind minor and more than minor. Okay, anyone else want to chime in on this one? Uh, so I, I, Commissioner, if sure. I could, just to kind of close on that, I, I think there are actually, I think, um, to the industry's credit, I mean, I know that there's the conversation around more than minor. I mean, they're, they're, the industry and the sites that we regulate and inspect aren't shy about pushing back either. And I think we've seen some of that as well, particularly in this conversation about what's minor, more than minor, and, and folks at the, the licensee folks asking the inspectors, you know, directly, how does this, how does this uh, compare with the, the criteria and how did you arrive at the decision you did that it fell on one line, one side of the line or the other? So I think, again, it's, it's more about defining what that line is and then perhaps, you know, the industry challenging vectors as well as us being more uh, introspective about it. I think it's a, a combination of all those things. Yeah, and just a very, very quick comment. Uh, I think regardless of whether it's minor or green, all issues, all violations, all corrected. They are required to be put into the corrective action process. So a lot of this is consistency. I think uh, consistency does create greater credibility for the agency. Yeah. There's, a, there's, just a, there's a paradox, I think, when we talk about these minor, more than minor, because by definition, we're talking about very low significance issues, by definition. And so in the interest of being risk informed and applying resources to try to, you know, uh, you know, be good, much more uh, uh, consistent about making those decisions across all the regions. You know, that takes resources to kind of balance and venture. And and so, but and so, it's a, a little bit of a paradox because it's a very low safety significance by definition, and we're spending resources to try to get better at it. So there's a, that's one argument to do nothing, but then the other argument is, yeah, but we're, we profess to be and we aspire to be as if reliable and consistent as we can possibly be. That's one of our principles of good regulation. And so if that's our interest, then it, we do need to invest energy in this to try to get better across the board. So. 
Okay. Let me ask a couple questions on the impacts of potential power reactor shutdowns. Uh, in the last few years, seven reactors have permanently shut down. Licensees have announced plans to shut down up to a dozen more reactors by 2025. How does the reduction in the number of operating reactors affect NRC's regions, and how do you think the regions should adapt to this reduction? Dave, Lou, do you want to start off on that one? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> so I, I think this morning's session touched on uh, this in, a, in sort of a way. Uh, the chairman and the EDO both talked about transformation as one decision at a time. And I think, uh, you know, for Region 1, we do have uh, a number of plants impacted, and you know, we have been making uh, one decision at a time. And we've made many decisions for the last <coughs> few years uh, since the announcement of uh, some of these plant shutdowns. Uh, and, and as we make these decisions, I think it's with an eye toward being positioned for multiple scenarios. Uh, these scenarios may be nearer term, some may be uh, further out. Uh, I, I think the other thing I heard this morning, and you may have heard this morning, is um, NRC has uh, declined by 25% uh, since 2010. Uh, in Region 1, since 2015, four years ago, we went from 229 FTE full-time employees to 183. That's a 25%, that's a 20% reduction in a four-year period. So certainly a lot of the decisions that we've been making over time has, has to do with people. But it's not just people. I think it's how we do our work, how we leverage technology, how we more efficiently use office space. And those types of decisions, uh, the results of those won't be known for a while because we're trying to position ourselves for the future. Um, I think one of the other things that we look at uh, very closely is making sure that we do the, have the right skills, the right competencies for the right work. Uh, I was talking to uh, Jeff Place earlier this morning and uh, it just occurred to me as we were talking, I'm not sure how we came, came talking, is, uh, the, you know, an example of a decision uh, that we made in Region 1. Uh, TMI uh, had announced its closure September of 2019. And so we've made uh, decisions and plans over a year ago. Uh, it's interesting as time has gone by, you know, our, our ongoing assumption was that they were going to likely shut down in September of 2009. 19. Well, that's not all that clear to us now. As we're, as we're looking at the environment, as we're looking at these changes and <clears throat> multiple scenarios, one of the things that we have to deal with is we have residents at the, at the site. And the residents have families, kids to go to school. And so it's very difficult for them to know whether or not they stay or not. And, and I think it's that uncertainty. So one of the decisions that uh, my management team was proactive, they actually reached out to the uh, TMI residents and guarantee them a year of work at home after 2019. This provide them certainty. And I think you know, those types of decisions to, to account for multiple scenarios, allow them to focus on safety and security, allow them to take care of their families, and I think it's a win-win situation. So there's a lot of these decisions. Uh, you know, how have we done? Don't really know because we continue to make a lot of these decisions. Uh, they, will, they will not stop and the results sometimes are delayed. Uh, but that said, I think uh, we have been maintaining our safety focus, safety and security focus. I think the ins resident inspectors that have transitioned or backfill near plants that were uh, shutting down, uh, that has gone seamlessly, and this is based on feedback from both uh, inspectors as well as licensees. In fact, one licensee uh, most recently uh, made a comment to me that they could not have done a better job I think the other thing I would want to highlight is, uh, based on surveys, staff engagement remains one of the highest in the federal government, despite a 20% reduction of staff in four years. So again, I think it's similar to transformation. It's one decision at a time that positions us for multiple scenarios. Tim, do you have thoughts on this one? Yes. Um, as he was just stated, as a Reactors are shut down. The NRC scope is, by definition, changing. <clears throat> and with any corporation, as things change, you have to change your organization and your process to match whatever your current scope is. And it's very important that we make those changes in a manner that does still focus on the safety and reliability of the stations, more of the safety aspects from the NRC's concern, 
with reliability from our concern. I mean, we're also being impacted because in the ERCOT market, it's very challenging. I've had to adjust my organization and my processes so that we can continue to produce power in a safe and reliable manner. Likewise, the NRC will need to adjust their organizations and processes to fit the scope. The one thing that I would really want to avoid in all this is as the scope changes, that there's no, not a necessarily a change or an increase in the recoverable fees adding to the burden on the stations just because the other stations are shutting down. It's more important that we get the proper resources adjusted within the NRC and the fees remain flat throughout the period of change. Uh, Dave Lachman? I think in the environment that the plant owners are in with s such uh, significant cost pressures or to control costs, I think that the NRC needs to look at its oversight process in that environment. The NRC's oversight process tends to focus on actions taken by plant owners, modifications to the plant, tests and inspections, changes to procedures and whatnot. More and more plant owners are, are deferring or canceling more and more activities. I think the NRC's oversight process needs to include a parcel that looks at those decisions to defer or cancel activities to ensure that they're properly justified to make sure that the safety and reliability doesn't fall as cost cutting proceeds. Yeah, and, and I agree with that, Dave. I, I do agree with that. I think uh, we have uh, some experience in learning about plans to have announced shutdowns. I do remember back way when Oyster Creek uh, the first time announced their plan shut down. And there are lessons to be learned from that. I think we incorporate a lot of those lessons and it's still more for us to learn into uh, our inspection oversight. Uh, and we have an, an appendix gulf, and I'm not sure what the, what the title of that <coughs> appendix gulf is in, in our manual chapter that looks specifically at plants shutting down, that focuses on outage scope, that focuses on retention of uh, licensed operators, work, you know, work control and, 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 and backlogs. Uh, so I think it's a, another, I, I agree with you, that's an area that we need to really focus on because it's a change uh, and uh, we'll continue to learn from that. Let me uh, broaden out slightly on, on a second question in this area. In this dynamic environment, what single change would you most like to see happen, and what single outcome would you most like to avoid? For folks who either chimed in the last one or else wants to express a view on that. Kathy? So I, I'm going to pick up on something that um, Dave said. I really think the, um, the focus either, and I can turn this either a good or a bad direction, answer both of them. It's really focusing on the critical skill sets and um, having the right individuals, the right inspectors, the right license reviewers, um, the right individuals in research working on a project at the right time to meet the needs, uh, to meet our needs as well as the industry needs. So it's really that focus on the people that I think is so so important in what we're doing. Any other thoughts on this one? Okay. I, th I think the single change, if, if I came for a day, I could get one change, it'd be the NRC safety culture needs to improve. The numbers that the NRC's had for the last five, 10 years are as bad as Davis Bessie in its worst, Millstone in its worst, TVA, Watts Bar in its worst, but nothing is being done to fix the NRC safety culture. The NRC knows what those fixes are because it required them to be done to those plants, but it tolerates as bad or worse safety culture internally. That's got to change. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just add, you know, one of the things I think is uh, it's not so much a change, but maybe in the area that we can improve better is communications. I, I think it's always a challenge, whether it's uh, on site with the inspectors, whether it's the uh, regions with the program office whether it's with the NRC or the industry. And I think what I see a lot very often is, you know, while we may communicate 80% not very well, it's that 10 or 20% where we don't communicate very well, that it results in a significant amount of time, resources, uh, attention being drawn away, uh, and, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, it can also detract from safety as well. Uh, I think uh, relative to things that I, want, I would definitely want to avoid is similar to what uh, Kathy says. I think we need to make sure that we have the right skills, the right competencies uh, to be a credible regulator. 
Okay. Uh, well, maybe uh, we'll turn to potential reactor oversight process changes. We're already getting some questions from the audience on that. Uh, as part of the current conversation on transformation at NRC, staff is considering potential changes to the reactor oversight process. How do you think the NRC staff should approach the many suggestions for changing the ROP um, that have come from within the agency and from external stakeholders? Are there suggested ROP changes that you see as particularly good or particularly bad ideas? And we had a, a question from the audience, what do you think um, are the most viable changes being considered for ROP? Uh, maybe on this one, start with uh, Dave Liu and then uh, get Preston's thoughts as well. Yeah, that was a lot of questions. Actually, I was all wondering. That was like a big compound question. It was. Actually, I was all wondering, do you want to switch places? I think <laughs> based no, on this I morning, I think I can facilitate. You may want to take this question. Uh, but uh, I, I think how we want to approach things is we do want to approach things with an open mind. Uh, and I think that's important uh, because I think that's part of, part of innovation is being receptive to ideas. And I think even if you... You know, you may have a reaction to an idea if you just stop, you know, take a step back and look at what's the underlying driver for that, for that uh, recommendation or that view. I think you'll find that there will be value as you integrate it into your overall assessment. Uh, I think one of the, um, the RP enhancement, there's a lot of, lot of issues out there. I, I think maybe I should probably touch on a hot topic one, and that's white findings. Uh, and, um, you know, this is, and I was trying to keep this short to two points because I'm sure a lot of people may want to weigh in on uh, white findings. But I did see uh, a uh, public interaction engagement uh, last week on, on white findings and on the ROP enhancement. One of the things that I've noticed is that we're not very clear in our uh, definition of terms and use of terms. We seem to sometimes use core damage, frequency, core damage probability CDP the same as delta CDP. And there is a difference. And when we talk about white findings, we're talking about the risk contribution for performance deficiency that's identified as site. Uh, and while that may be considered low, I think it's also in the context of what that, what that uh, finding is in. Because the plant risk changes over time. We recently had a uh, white finding. In the context of that white finding, uh, there was also another safety equipment that was out of service. Uh, that equipment was out of service because of a deficiency, although there was not performance deficiency, there was deficiency. And what that, and when you layer that over top, it's not additive. And it's much closer than to uh, the, uh, quant the, the safety goals. Uh, so I, I think that's the perspective that we need to sort of think about relative to what we're measuring with a performance deficiency. Uh, the other thing uh, which, and, and probably a more important point, at least for me, is I do agree that plants are safer than, no, than ever. Modifications and, and other things have lower risk. And so from the perspective of uh, the threshold for white findings, okay, a, a plant that actually reaches that threshold now, has a lot of things have to have gone wrong. A lot of holes have to have aligned. And, and so when we take a look at that and reaches that threshold, you know, there's two questions. One, if, if performance is getting better, and we're maintaining the threshold, the idea of raising the threshold is not intuitive to me. Um, the other aspect of it is if a lot of holes are matching up, the question that we have to ask is, is this, is this isolated or is this system systemic? We need to ask that question. And I think when we look at operating experience, we've had two plants that have gotten to column four. I think it's Perry and Pilgrim, just on white findings. And so there were systemic issues. And I think when we look at the underlying basis of the reactor over, oversight process, there has to be a vehicle in which we get to, that, to those issues for those outlier plants. Uh, so you know, I, I think you know, there's a lot to be, there's a lot of other issues associated with it. I'm sure there's a lot of perspectives, so I'll just stop there and have others yeah. chime in and weigh in. I mean, certainly the ROP has been the most impactful process on on our day-to-day -day operation and I think if you look at if you look at the uh, results it's produced it's by and large been a force for good I mean it's, it's been effective it's improved safety and you know, it's been around for 20 years I would say though what what tool have we used for 20 years what process have we used for 20 years and then turn around and say there's not some room for improvement there's not something we can do to make it 
a uh, force for better good. You know, I think it would be, I think it's entirely reasonable for us to optimize the, R, the, the ROP and work in a way that uh, can eliminate any of the redundancies it creates. It ag we could aggregate the efficiencies that exist within the process. You know, you know perhaps more importantly, make sure that the uh, ROP is is being used is being used for the benefit of safety and not the benefit of you know expanding or or uh, or making larger some new regulation or some some new rule and you know when I look at the when I look at what we get out of it you know I, I just I've got a I've got a finite amount of resources and I'm going to invest them in something you know, time energy uh, money and you know, am I going to go and do I want to invest and chase you know, low safety significant issues that I can fix quickly or but, but we're too focused on that at the expense of something that perhaps is uh, bigger in the in the operations and I just I just think the ROP ought to be continue to be used as a force for good and continue to uh, you know, make sure that we're focused on, on uh, improvements in real safety I want to get Dave Lockbaum's thoughts too but Preston is there if you're thinking about the universe of potential changes what would you have at the top of your list is like the thing that you think would be most beneficial for a change well, we, we talk about white findings, so you know I'll move heaven and earth to avoid a white finding. Uh, I have spent countless amounts of dollars, where we end up in some you know frothy area about some tiny number. It's not changing a single action I'm taking. All it's doing is taking more time, you know, for me to, to complete it. You know, we we treat a white finding just like we do any other finding, uh, and I again I think that I think that detracts. I, I would like to get to where you know. How you move across the columns, I think, is there's a good way of doing that. You know, the white was kind of that great in between, and I just think there are opportunities where, you know, I thought it was interesting. We, we talked earlier about you know green findings, the number of green findings, you know, the number of you know what are significant findings, what are less significant NCVs. You know, we count the findings, but in the end, I, I capture comments in my corrective action. They only have to be a finding me to act on it we capture the comments and in the end once it enters into the corrective action program the, the color of the the color of the driver kind of goes to the background we were compelled to at least we feel compelled uh, to fix it so here just the baggage that goes along with this uh, with this white finding uh, it slows us down it slows us down and it, it creates a level of attention that that's not commensurate with its safety significance so I put that one at the top of my list Commissioner. Sure. Uh, Dave, did you want to share some thoughts? I think the ROP and the maintenance rule are two of the three best things the NRC's done. Uh, and I think the ROP offers a model to be applied to changes to the ROP. The ROP uses performance indicators supplemented by inspection findings as, as its key drivers. Similarly, changes to the ROP could be monitored for effectiveness using either metrics or annual periodic assessments to ensure that the expectations that everybody had for improvements or optimization have actually been achieved and without any uh, uh, unintended consequences. So I think using the ROP model to evaluate changes to the ROP could get the out to the end point that we all want. Good. Any other thoughts on our ROP changes? Yep. Scott, were you? So I, I just want to I appreciate and respect Preston's comments, um, and uh, and I've seen that. Um, not just it's not just an anecdote; it's true. The the moving heaven and earth to avoid a white finding, and and not to be overly provocative here, but I, I guess you know, as one of the founding members of the working group who created this thing we now call the ROP, and the and the process that we went through collaboratively with the industry, granted it was 20 years ago, and with Dave and other uh, uh, externals and members of the public, the, the, the idea was you would have a graded approach, obviously, and that, you know, there would be some threshold, there would be thresholds built in that would enable the regulator to gradually in to increase its oversight posture as more risk significant issues popped up. I guess my point is, and I will also say that we have made ch changes to our oversight program to account for some of what you're talking about. Um, and I'm not just talking about risk-informed thinking in general terms, but more specifically, we've changed the inputs required 
to get to move columns in the action matrix from two to three whites, for example. And so part of that was to address this concern about the implications of a white finding and, you know, to kind of relieve some of that urge to push back so hard on a white finding, which was never intended, I can tell you, it was never intended to be this, you know, major thing. I mean, it was expected that there would be a lot of white findings. Um, so I, not pushing back, but I'd like to personally understand more about what, why is it that the industry feels so compelled to quote, to use your terms, move heaven and earth, unquote, to avoid a white finding. When at the end of the day, what we're really concerned of is about safety and, and agreeing on what the performance deficiency is, and more importantly, focusing on the corrective actions that are, that are appropriate and durable. Yeah. So it's really a, uh, it's a difference in views. And I know that uh, from the regulator side, and I've, I've heard this said, what's the big deal? It's a 40 hour inspection. This is awkward that we're just sitting yeah. here talking. <laughs> <laughs> the audience didn't push back, you did. <laughs> but the, uh, but you, know, you know, it's a 40 hour inspection when in fact it's so much more than that. And uh, the, the fact that, you know, how we move across the columns, uh, it's a step in the right direction, but it's still a vulnerability. And in fact, you could, take, uh, you could take these white findings and put them together, and they might not equal anything, but just the fact that they exist, now we infer there's some bigger problem. And I would tell you that if you aggregate, if you, if you go across the way and you aggregate white findings and that starts pushing you across the columns, something else has broken down in our monitoring, something else has broken down in our assessments that, have, that has allowed that to happen. I mean, you've had root causes that have looked at extent of conditions. You've got, there's something going on in the corrective action program. There's something going on in the site's oversight. There's something going on with the, uh, with the operation of the facility. When we find ourselves, you know, in a position having to move across the column, uh, move across columns simply based on white findings. And I, I will just add to that. Thank you. Um, the, the, the bit about the supplemental inspections, the 40, the nominal 40 hours, you know, I, I think it's, we've done, we've looked at that. We're probably still looking at that um, to try to enhance what, you know, not only the nominal amount of resources, but what it is we're trying to accomplish, refine the procedure that's associated with 9501, for those of you who know. Um, so I think work has been not fully up to speed on where we're at with all that stuff. But I, I do believe, to your point, that there's room for us to improve on, you know, to, to be held more accountable, so to speak, on the amount of resources we spend once a white finding is identified uh, to, to follow up on that. So I, I'm not, I won't, I won't push back on that piece. And I'll go a little bit further. I, I, I agree with you uh, that there is a difference whether it's one or two uh, within a period of time. When it's one, you can, you can make the argument that he's isolated. But you still have to ask the question. And in fact, most plants that transition to column two transition back to column one. Um, I think uh, when you do have two, then you need to ask the question, is there something more systemic to you know, highlight the systemic over the, uh, uh, the isolated? And I think that's what we're trying to do. And it's beyond, I think, as we're looking at this uh, and getting input and views, I think it's beyond just the uh, number of hours. I think it has to be, what's the scope? You know, what is the scope of, say, one white input versus two white inputs? Because there is a difference. There is a difference in terms of the belief there's something systemic going on. We, we are spend all day on this topic, so we probably should move on. Well, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me ask one more sub-question on this, because you're, you're right, we're totally inundated with questions, and we can't spend too much more time on potential ROP changes. But I did want to ask, um, what do you think about crediting licensee self-assessments in lieu of NRC baseline inspections? I personally am totally neutral on this topic, <laughs> <laughs> but I need your thoughts on it. <laughs> Anyone want to chime in on that one? I'll take that one. I think there's a role for self-assessments. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, I think we do do it, right? We do do it with uh, emergency preparedness and, and other things. But I, I think there's a balance. There's a balance in terms of how much self-assessment versus how much uh, independent inspection. I think there, there's, there is also a value of self-assessment in terms of uh, trying to allow licensees to hone that skill within its own organization. And that does have a, a, a overall safety benefit. But, but again, the harder question is, 
Not that I'm open to it, but what's the right balance? Others so, have thoughts? So I had a beautiful set of notes on this topic, and then uh, I sat in the session earlier, and I just started scratching through them all furiously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I look at you know, life, the self-assessments and how they should be looked at, Adoption is the sincerest form of flattery. So if you look at what's going on with inspect, we prepare we prepare for the uh, for the inspection. In fact, I mean, we get the inspection procedures; they're publicly available. We we use those as a template. We supplement the those actions that uh, that are in the inspection procedure with our own with our own uh, preparation activities, and uh, we we come out with a better product. So we find things earlier. So by the time the team has arrived on site. You know, we've done we've done a lot of that work. It's not saying we don't the team the the NRC team will come in the inspectors they still find things, but uh, you know this could be why some of the things they find are less significant than what they did before, and it's because uh, you know, you get 40 50 years of operation under your belt. You get you know all these years of inspection uh, OE that uh, that you've had the uh, benefit of, and you learn from that and you apply it. So. Uh, I'm on the other side of the uh, fence on this one. I think the fact that we're mimicking, the fact that we're mimicking those uh, activities, and the fact that we do it with integrity, and you know, I would invite the regulator, I invite the industry, I invite our own oversight folks to come in and and test, you know, test whether we're performing these activities with integrity and creating a product. And if you do that in your product, I think we've got the outcome. And if you've got the outcome, and it's uh, it's an outcome that's conducive to safety. How can that be a uh, how can that be a bad thing? This is a to me this is a uh, this is the great thing about our business is that I don't know how many other businesses where uh, the, the the outcome the regulator desires the outcome that the operator desires I mean they overlap they're 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 a shared mission this idea of safety is a shared mission and uh, so so far I would tell you that the work that we've done to mimic what the regulator has done has created better outcomes and it's driven our regulatory performance indicators in a good direction. It's driven the plant performance indicators in a good direction. And here, Dave? I was initially uh, very much against self-assessments, um, but the working group that the NRC uh, formed to investigate this issue came up with a fairly good model for allowing self-assessments to be in. The concern I had with self-assessments was a point that Preston spoke to, is we're not invited in to look. NRC is invited in, or is in, but the public isn't. So the public needs some assurance that the self-assessments is of the same rigor, of the same value as an NRC inspection. And what the NRC's working group proposed was to have annual inspections, modules, that would be done, some by NRC, some op open for self-assessments. That process would allow the public to compare the results from inspections done of similar areas to see if they are of similar, similar detail and similar results. For example, the industry self-assessments had an average of eight findings per inspection. The NRC found nothing, which probably wouldn't happen, but, or vice versa. That would give you an indication of what was the value of the self-assessments versus the NRC inspections. But there needs to be something on the back end to allow the public to see that the self-assessments were comparable to, or perhaps better, than the NRC inspections. Absent that, I'm against self-assessments. If I could add, I, I'm all in for self-assessments. We think, I mean, I think my counterparts would agree, self-assessments are a great tool. They've identified a lot of things. I just don't know, to Dave's point, how adopting a licensee self-assessment in lieu of uh, uh, NRC inspection meets our fundamental principle of being an independent regulator. And I, I struggle with that. Um, so I look for innovative ways. If there are innovative ways to do it, then again, I think they're beneficial. But, uh, and again, I'm not picking on Preston, but you know, the self-assessments and you, and you absolutely, you identify your own issues and you said it yourself, our guys come in and often will find more issues. So there's something in that too, right? So there, there's there's value being added in, in both in both camps. Um, on, obviously, safety is fundamentally in your camp where it should be.
But again, this notion of being an independent regulator, I, I think we're going to struggle. We have struggled, and I think we'll continue to struggle and be smarter than me, figures out a way to take credit for that and call it an independent review. So I, I would tell you that I'm aligned with you on the independence. There's, I mean, certainly you have to go in and, and either pulse, sample the product to make sure that it's being done with, uh, <coughs> one, it's being done with rigor, and again, it's being done with, with integrity. So, uh, you know, I don't know that a self-assessment in and of itself needs to, uh, uh, you know, close the door on on independence. So you, we have a we have a resident on site. He doesn't spend you know 100 percent of his time in any one area in the plant, but he's still he's assessing the operation of the of the facility and making sure we're doing that in compliance with our with our license. So um, I think we could work around the independence piece without you know bringing in an entire another team to basically duplicate the effort of the licensee. <coughs> uh, with regard to finding things, I agree with you. They find things. I could bring in, uh, I could create a site team and then I could go bring in a second site team. They would find something. And if I brought them in a third time, I'm sure they would find something. So the, you know, the fact that you know, they find things, I don't, in my mind, does not, uh, does not mean that the, the does not you know, really say anything about the quality of the assessment. It just means that we found things. It's, if we use that, we wouldn't send a, a second team back because you find things after you go look again at the, at the same uh, same facility. So the independence piece is making sure that the public is uh, is aware of what's going on in the uh, in the assessments. I think those are all valid concerns. I think they're all uh, concerns that are entirely solvable. Darrell, it looked like you wanted yeah. to get in there. So <clears throat> I think everybody at the table here at least agrees in principle that conceptually. The idea of a self-assessment aspect to the ROP is something to consider, and it's, you're, what you're really talking about is self-policing. Um, you know, how much should the industry be allowed to self-police what it does and how it operates? And that's not a foreign concept to the NRC, right? We've we've instituted that in the operator licensing process, where you know, one, at one point we wrote all the exams for operator licensed for licensed operators. Um, we've turned that over to the industry for the most part, with the exception of one that we write for proficiency purposes. Um, team inspections, I know that there's an element uh, of, in our ROP and, and our team engineering inspections, for example, or hardware. We credit licensees or we allow licensees to take credit for issues that they identify as part of a self-assessment before we get there, before the team gets there. Um, the recent paper that the commission uh, issued, the SRM on force on force um, inspections, where we now are going to be um, allowing licensees to uh, conduct a force on force on top of the one that we conduct. All of those are aspects of I would what I would call self policing. The question I think becomes, or the issue becomes, at least for the staff, is you know what's the aggregate impact of all of that, right? So when you institute this this change, um, you know how does that aggregate with the other aspects of self-policing that are already instituted in, the, in our oversight processes. And to what extent can the NRC still be involved in that, right? So if we do allow a self-assessment, um, you know, aspect to our oversight, you know, can NRC staff um, at the working level or at the staff level still be engaged somehow? And to what extent does that engagement take place? So I think conceptually self-assessment is not you know, alone the issue is just, you know, to what extent does that aggregate? Kathy? So thanks. Um, I had the opportunity of um, being a little bit closer to the discussions about um, the engineering inspections last year uh, that Dave mentioned. The working group as uh, one of my division directors was leading that effort. And um, it was interesting for me to watch the thought process evolve over last year with regards to um, giving duration to the um, uh, credit for the licensee self-assessment. And I think a little bit different approach from my, my peers is um, I think it's the how you do it that we need to focus on. And then I think at this point, going back, to, I think to the original question is how do you move forward on this? Um, should there be a decision from the commission to go forward on it? Is it's really that dialogue that needs to take place um, uh, between um, the public interest groups, between the NRC and the licensee is about how would we give the credit and how much. So I think from my perspective, there are a few more questions that need to be answered. It's more that process-oriented 
aspect because we have evolved a lot over the last year with regards to giving credit for the licensee self-assessment. And even if you go back to, I think three years ago, um, the same panel had a discussion on life, licensee self-assessments and it was, it was a, uh, almost, I don't wanna say a definite no, but it was a lot more to the no side than the yes side. Uh, so I think it's, it's the benefit of more dialogue on this over the upcoming year. We should probably move on. Um, uh, Dave, your comment earlier about um, NRC safety culture got at least a couple cards. Uh, one, one of the questions is directed at you, and then there's a question directed at the regional administrators. Um, the question for you was, can you explain a little bit more about your statement on NRC safety culture and what you were basing your conclusions on? And for the regional administrators, maybe one of you want to take this or others have thoughts, um, just any reaction to Dave's comment about NRC safety culture? Years yes. ago, uh, UCS issued my report called NRC, uh, Safety Culture, Do As I Say, Not As I Do. I think it's still available on the UCS website. I also think it's in NRC's Adams. I went through a number of uh, case studies looking at Davis, Bessie, Millstone, South Texas, not South Texas, Susquehanna, Watts Bar. Sorry. <laughs> he didn't kick me. I corrected myself. <laughs> <laughs> and looked at the numbers that were available that drove the NRC to take actions to address safety culture issues at those plants, and then used studies from the annual workplace survey that's conducted of federal agencies, including the NRC, and the triennial OIG Inspector General's surveys of the NRC workforce. If you look at the numbers from those surveys and compare them to the numbers that existed at Susquehanna and davis Bessie and so on, the NRC's numbers are worse, or nearly as bad or worse, and yet nothing is being done to fix, other than hoping it fixes itself, nothing is being done to fix the NRC's internal safety culture. It was a big problem to the NRC when it occurred at Davis Bessey and Watts Bar and these plants, and yet the NRC doesn't hold a mirror up to itself to fix its own problems of equal or greater magnitude. That's just unacceptable. Thoughts? So I'll go first, and I'm sure my uh, counterparts here will have something to say. So from the standpoint of, um, I guess, yes, aware of Dave's, um, that report, and I guess I would take, um, I, I, in your comment, Dave, relative nothing being done to fix, because I think the agency over, over the years has done things um, to uh, try and address the safety culture. I'm not going to speak from the agency perspective, but I'll speak from the regional perspective. So within the region, we really are looking at the different aspects of what can we do, and, and a lot of it falls down to increasing dialogue and communication with our staff. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've done um, uh, training and speed of trust training, which is the Covey. We've done, uh, looked at increasing emotional intelligence. But I would say really when it gets down at the end of the day, it's really that that face-to-face -face conversation that makes the big difference, whether it's between the regional administrator and, and an inspector or a division director and an inspector, but it's improving that communication that I think is, is going to make the difference. And I think in Region 2, I would say it has made a difference uh, over years. And um, we have several other initiatives underway, but I think I want to leave time for my peers here to comment also. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, um, and speaking specifically for Region 3, we've done a, a number of things to address what we, what we think is an area for improvement. I don't believe that it's, I don't believe the problem is, as, as Mr. Lockbaum has stated, is um, as, as dire perhaps as it, as it was made to sound. Um, in the agency, but specifically in Region 3. I mean, we've had a number of communications about issues involving disputed violations or violations or enforcement issues that occur in Region 3 that uh, involve a number of differing views uh, with staff. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think those require uh, an additional level of communication so that staff understands, you know, the bases for decisions that are made. Um, sometimes it requires more. I'll call it care and feeding, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, there are some recent issues in Region 3, for example, that were overturned. Uh, enforcement actions that were, um, you know, reversed from what Region 3 had proposed. Um, and we've taken a number of issues to communicate around that because we know how sensitive those are. Um, and in, in arriving at those decisions, we, you know, had opportunities for many, many opportunities for diverse views to be expressed by staff. Um, um, 
so I, I don't know that the problem is as dire as what was communicated, but I know that we've taken actions in at least this region, and as Kathy has stated, her region and the other regions as well, to address that, that kind of issue. So, If I could just add, about this time last year, a little bit earlier, just slightly over a year ago, the NRC itself issued a report looking into the differing views program. And among the things that report found, which we obtained by FOIA eventually, because the NRC did not make it public, was that more than 100% of those that raised differing views felt they were retaliated against for doing so. 100%. Watts Bar, Millstone, any of those plants had 6%, 7% saying they'd been retaliated for raising a safety concern, NRC be all over them like ugly on an A. 100%. NRC employees raised a safety concern, felt they were retaliated against, and NRC's not doing much about it? Well, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. They are taking action, they're just not taking effective action to fix the problem. Um, I, I, would, I want to thank David. I would echo what, what Daryl and, and, and Kathy mentioned and supplement it with, um, um, if the folks don't know, the, the study or the report that, that Mr. Lockbaum refers to, there actually is underway, in fact, just got unveiled fairly recently. All the actions that we're taking, the office of our office of enforcement owns that program. Um, we all own it, but they're nominally uh, in charge of the procedure and, and counting and tracking and managing the, the overall effort. And there's a lot of um, a lot of new initiatives and mechanisms that we're we're about ready to roll out to enhance the program. So. Yes, they're not visible yet, but they're coming. But more specific to Region 4, um, you know, we're, we've gone all in on uh, the Franklin Covey Speed of Trust in Region 4, um, we, you know, and I'm not going to make you per, in, uh, experts on what that is, but essentially it comes down to 13 fundamental behaviors that, that enhance trust relationships. And at the end of the day, um, in order for there to be effective and meaningful exchange of information, you have to trust the source and you have to trust, you know, you have to trust the information. And so we, we are including that language of speed of trust in our day-to-day -day business. Um, we, we are trying to, and we are asking our staff to hold the leadership accountable for when we're not demonstrating those behaviors. We encourage it and then when we, they point it out to us, we make we make a big thank you, you know. I mean, we and we'll share that stuff um, as broadly as we can. And 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 I think more, perhaps more importantly, all the you know when it comes to the technical work that we do, the safety work that we do, our inspectors, virtually every inspection ha is is debriefed in front of the, their peers and their management, um, and and it allows it does a number of different things. Number one, it enables other people to exam, it makes you a better inspector and it enhances your ability to articulate thoughts and ideas in a clear and comprehensive way. That's number one. But more, I think, more to it enables the rest of the staff and management to inquire as to what the issue is, why, it, why it's being assessed the way it is, and offer different thoughts and ideas. And it really engenders a really good conversation around all the technical issues that we're batting around and weighing, and oftentimes that results in us changing what our initial, the initial vector that we were on. And I think ultimately it makes us better and it enhances trust and it enhances, um, obviously, communication and ultimately I think will make us, continue to make us a better regulator. Yeah, I, I think any safety organization, we need to, as, as a safety organization, we really always have to be thinking about safety culture and, and how we can do better. Uh, and, and and it's hard sometimes to measure, you know, uh, but you have data points. Uh, one such data point is I think, uh, I think I've been told that I'm flat wrong by my staff like once a day. Uh, and uh, I'm sure after this meeting, I'm gonna be getting text messages that you're flat wrong, Dave. <laughs> All right, well, we've gotten some um, questions on specific um, rules or, um, Inspections. Let me let me start with one on the maintenance rule. Uh, what are your thoughts on industry's initiative to relook at the maintenance rule? Um, and as the as the questioner characterizes it, in the context of having better inspection technologies that can increase effectiveness and reduce costs of maintenance rule implementation. Thoughts on the maintenance rule and potential changes to it. 
Well, I mean, I would say with regard to the maintenance rule, it, I mean, yeah, the maintenance rule has overall been has been good. It uh, it points out things about your equipment. It it, uh, it allows you, it gives you a very structured uh, way to ensure uh, high levels of reliability of, of equipment that's important to uh, to safety. But again, if there's a if there's a way to do the maintenance rule better, to do the maintenance rule more effective, to do the maintenance rule uh, with less resource. And, uh, and achieve the same outcome, then, then I'll sign up for it. Other thoughts on maintenance rule, either its current effectiveness or potential changes to it? Really along the same things. We're always looking for ways to make things more efficient. If there's a way to check and adjust, make it more efficient, that's good. We use the maintenance rule quite a bit because we use it as a backstop to our risk-informed technical specifications because it helps give us that extra piece of information that our equipment is operating well while we're using the condition risk based tech specs and have the extended LCO times to do work. It helps us get that understanding that we're not, well, for lack of a better word, abusing our ability to do that under risk managed tech specs. I guess I'll just chime in. I, I, I do remember when the maintenance rule came to play and we were trying to uh, uh, how do we regulate that uh, from outside? And I think there was a learning curve, but I think over time, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the issues and concerns have been uh, largely resolved and uh, just by absence of uh, any, any feedback that I get from uh, my staff, I, I don't know that there is a, a huge issue there that we need to adjust from a regulatory point of view, uh, uh, given how many other things that we need to work on. I guess I would just add, echo what Dave said. You know, from a regulatory perspective, I don't know that the maintenance rule itself needs um, to be changed. As long, in as much as it has flexibility to allow licensees to use their own risk um, profiles to uh, categorize uh, systems within the maintenance rule to manage online risk and those things, uh, if there are changes in the risk profiles at, at various plants, then those insights, you know, if there if there have been significant improvement in the risk at a site, then that insight should be used to affect how a licensee might the hows of how a licensee might implement the maintenance <clears throat> rule in terms of what systems are or how systems are treated and so on. But the rule itself, I don't know to what extent that needs to change from my perspective. We also got a question. Um, uh, at least initially directed at the uh, regional administrators, um, interested in your perspective on the efficacy of the EQ program inspection. Well, let me start with that. <laughs> so, so just a little bit of history. As we as we first began, as when I back, this was a few years back when I was in NRR. I, we we were uh, challenged. Um, to you know, look hard at our what we component design basis inspections (CDBIs), which uh, you know, by any measure, is a is a is a is a tough inspection. You know, it's resource intensive; it digs deep, but intentionally so. It was intended to be uh, a deep dive in a couple of different areas. You know, whereas we tend to inspect, you know, this is a bad analogy, a mile wide and an inch deep on a lot of things that happen day to day at a plant. This is one of the few areas where we actually took a deep dive and, you know, drill a borehole into an area. And, in, 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 in again, I mean, as the name would imply, was to assess the, uh, the, the maintenance of the plant and, and its consistency with the design basis for which we, you know, we originally licensed it. And so, you know, it tended to yield a lot of low significance issues. Sometimes it, it identified some pretty significant issues. but. But more importantly, it gave us some programmatic insights, which, you know, I know that programma programmatic inspection is somewhat of a four-letter word in our OP space, but it, it, it truly did give us insight into how well engineering uh, programs were being, you know, and it gave us a certain amount of confidence uh, that the programs were viable, et cetera. Um, but when we were challenged to examine how we conducted that inspection, uh, one of the changes we we made was to, to, whereas we used to do a three-week focused deep dive in a number of different areas, 17 to 22 samples or 25 samples, and we backed off on that to two weeks and took a one and did a pilot. Again, we don't do much out here without trying it out first. So we did a pilot 
one week programmatic inspection um, instead of the quote unquote deep dive into one particular system or set of components. So we, we batted around, well, what program should we look at? And one of the things that came up on the list, one of them was motor operated valves. I mean, there were a bunch of different things, but how could, what one thing should we look at holistically? And the idea of environmental qualification, 5049 programs came up uh, in, in, in no small part because um, we haven't looked at that in a long, long time. And it's, but, but I think more importantly, it was there are a lot of fundamental assumptions about what's going to work and what systems are required to work and operate reliably if, God forbid, a major design basis accident occurs. And a lot of those safety systems that are going to be called upon to operate in that, on, on those, under those circumstances are going to be in harsh environments, the sensors, et cetera. And so, we simply hadn't looked at environmental qualification issues in like two decades. And we thought, well, here's an opportunity. If we're going to pilot this program, here's a perfect opportunity because all these risk models that we talk about and rely on to inform our decision making fundamentally are predicated on assumptions about what's going to work and how reliable it is. And then we don't test EQ components under harsh environments, uh, certainly not. So this was an opportunity for us to programmatically focus on EQ, and I think it taught us a lot. We learned a lot. Yes, it identified a lot of issues. Yes, we, we've learned a lot. Yes, the industry's learned a lot. Yes, we've learned about how to manage our program, and I think based on those learnings, we're continuing to evolve our engineering inspections. Preston or Tim, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, we've, uh, EQ, EQ's one of those areas where I feel less smart coming out of the conversation than I did going into it. It's, uh, it, and it. And it's almost universally true when we deal with it. But my experience with EQ is uh, I value the EQ inspections uh, because you know, our, our plants have personally benefited from many of our EQ inspections. It's a, I can recall, it's probably been six or seven years ago now where uh, our tech staff took a position, very hard position on <coughs> EQ. We were wrong. The, and this is, in this case, the inspector was, uh, was exactly right. Because of the inspection, we had an opportunity to fix that. Uh, we've got examples that goes in the other direction, but certainly this is one where, you know, our view of whether things would work or not was different. To Scott's point, uh, we are going to rely on these, these, pe these uh, important pieces of equipment under very harsh conditions. We ought to know, we ought to have confidence that they will work. So the value of the EQ inspection, I'm totally in line with. You know, the way we go about it, or you know, we might have uh, issues with you know, long-standing URIs. I, I feel like we get a lot of URIs on EQ now that I wish the uh, that uh, you know, my technical staff and the and the uh, agency's technical staff could somehow get to a quicker agreement on what's required. But beyond that, that in no way should detract from the importance of this idea of EQ qualifications on our equipment. Kathy, do you want to so add? So I would, um, so Scott did a good job at looking backwards. I would say what did the agency learn from this and going forward and some important lesson learns from us. Um, there were a large number of URIs um, in the, from com, resulting from the region two inspections. Preston mentioned a few of those. Those are unresolved issues. Yes, unresolved I'm not issues. Be the acronym sorry, I'm just... sorry, okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I was testing to see if you really read the new reg. <laughs> oh, I read you it. You passed, you passed. <laughs> 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 So, um, so we have uh, really been focused on the EQ inspections down in Region 2 recently, um, and uh, we're moving forward with, with resolving those unresolved items. Um, but I think there are a few things that we need to, uh, well, we pride ourselves in being a learning organization, and whether we call it a formal lessons learned or an informal lessons learned, I think one of the key things was is when we, uh, is looking at what we learned from doing the EQ inspections, and should we go forward with these focused engineers? engineering inspections to try to apply some of these lessons learned. And um, from my perspective, it really is very important to have the guidance um, available for our inspectors as they launch on these uh, engineering, uh, the focused engineering inspections. Um, <clears throat> in developing that guidance, again, a very key thing is the, the um, having the public meetings where 
um, there's clear understanding on, on all parties on what we will be looking at and, and what's acceptable. Uh, and then, again, in several of the areas when we get into these focused inspections is setting up uh, cross-regional um, panels for when we do um, have the inspection findings. Again, of course, when an inspector comes back, there's dialogue within the region itself. But then as we move forward, if there's any potential for enforcement um, action at whatever level, is just to make sure that we do have consistency across the region. Uh, and this, this really goes to some of our cores of the consistency and the transparency. So my really hope um, outside of doing the EQ inspections and the focus on the importance for that and the safety uh, impacts of um, the things that we looked at and that is but from learning from these EQ inspections and then applying them to moving forward if we do go into the focused engineering uh, areas inspections. Well, maybe we could uh, switch gears a little bit. We had several questions that are resource related, some of them um, uh, for the regional administrators, some of them for uh, our industry executives. But maybe we could start with the regional administrator questions. Uh, and I'll just take a couple of them and uh, throw it out at you all in a compound question, and you can uh, address it as you will. Um, one question relates to um, staffing in the regions. Uh, notes, uh, as Dave Lou did, that the staffing has been reduced significantly in recent years. Should staffing levels continue to be reduced, what is the right size? And then related, potentially, um, given power reactor shutdowns, what do you think of consolidation of the regions? Uh, so let me let me uh, take the last question first. You know, I, I think, uh, and I just want to reemphasize. You know, we talk about transformation one one decision at a time, and so we ought not be. Uh, you know, I don't focus on that particular future as a likely future or not. I think what we want to do is we want to continue to uh, do those things uh, that allow us to be positioned for whatever situation that we, uh, we come in. And when you think about that, when you do that, uh, it do does show, you know, where you put your resources, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how much space that we use, uh, how do we uh, communicate with each other, how do we leverage uh, information technology. And it's not until you get to that point and then you get to the point of trying to decide. I think you have to take a look at the cost benefit, right? And you have to take a look at the, and, and it's not just the dollars, but cost benefit of people, of effectiveness, of safety. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, that's one of those hypothetical questions which I think what we do now is we do as we are doing with everything, you know, one decision at a time that positions us well for the future. And I have to talk for so long, I think, um, I forgot the first part of the question, but I just remember. <laughs> Staffing levels. Uh, and, yeah. so, so, you know, I, I think it's not, you know, from my perspective, I think the regions are fully funded for the work that we have to do. I think this agency does a great job ensuring that we have the right resources uh, for what we need to do. And, and, and the way it's done is they do take a look at the work that we're assigned. And so as plants uh, are shut down, you know, they recognize that we have less work and they, they plan accordingly. Uh, and we'll continue to do that, I think. And I, and, and I don't see anything in the horizon that doesn't say that uh, uh, a, a top priority for this agency is our, our inspectors out there in the field as our eyes and ears. So. So I would, uh, so Region 2, while we don't have any plants that are decommissioning in Region 2 specifically, um, what my challenge is is the new construction areas because um, uh, last year we had the sudden drop in resources when Summer made the decision to not go forward with the new build. Uh, looking forward to a few years from now, uh, the need for construction with the Vogel site will also go down, if, assuming um, the plans go forward as uh, Southern has planned for the Vogel 3 and 4. So with that, again, that will have a significant impact on the region because the individuals that were doing construction now will no longer be doing the construction inspection unless there is some new build in the United States. So I, I still am kind of a similar to where Dave has the challenge, say, with the decommissioning plants, I have the challenge with regarding um, balancing the right staff with in region two relative to new construction. So I think, uh, so we all have our own unique challenges with that. With that being said, I think region two, again, is that we have to, we're always mindful of making sure that we have the right critical skills uh, and, uh, available to us. And that may not necessarily be individuals that are housed within region two because 
Um, should I need um, a, a resource, I have available three other regions that would be very happy to help me, I think. Um, and, uh, and of course, resources that, that could come to bear from headquarters. So we do have the opportunity to reach out when we do um, need help. And then the last thought that I would say is the thing that I really look for when we're looking at staffing is really identifying what we need to do and then we resource it. Um, where I have the most challenges is that, you know, and just being told you have to take an X percentage cut because I think we really need to de develop the inspection program that matches, um, goes out and looks at safety and security, and from that we build uh, what our staffing needs are. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I would just piggyback on, on that, um, on both what Dave and Kathy said, that I don't have a specific answer to the question on what, you know, whether or not consolidation at this point is the right thing. I would offer that um, there, there are a number of factors that go into that decision or that analysis. One, obviously, is the number of plants, um, you know, down the road, the number of plants that are permanently shut down between now and time X. Another is this, the ongoing changes that we're, we're looking at now, the ROP enhancement efforts, the, the, um, the efforts to streamline our oversight. And quite frankly, let's, you know, let's be frank, we're talking primarily about changes in the reactor oversight part of our mission because that makes up two-thirds of, of the agency's budget. So obviously that's big impact on the regional structure going forward. Our materials program is a smaller fraction of that, obviously, and we have an agreement states, um, you know, across the country. So that's not, changes in that area aren't going to really impact the decision, I don't believe, as much as the reactor piece. But um, as long as those two factors, the, the, the permanent plant uh, operating status or the future shutdown status, as well as ongoing changes to our oversight processes are in play, I think those are the two main things that need to factor into our, um, our, our decision on that. So I'm going to touch on the staffing piece, and I'll speak to Region 4, but I think it's germane to the other regions and perhaps the agency as a whole. The thing that worries me the most, well, first of all, let's, let me just say this. I'm biased towards inspectors. I have a high affinity for, for our folks in the field who are working uh, at the sites, uh, who are doing the day-to-day -day safety mission in this agency. I did that job for seven years. So I'm, I'm highly biased towards the importance of that work. Uh, we have great inspectors in Region 4, as we do in the other three regions, two of whom are in the room here with us today from Region 4. And why do I bring that up? Because I am concerned, and this, this, is, a, this is a legitimate concern of mine, in a continuing downward, pre, uh, downward with a continuing downward fiscal pressure on our staffing and our resources, which is appropriate. I understand it. It makes sense. The practical implication of that has been, till now, that we are not bringing in at a sufficient rate uh, new staff. At the same time, and you heard some of this this morning, at the same time where our, our current inspector cadre is aging, wants to get off the road, is going to retire, moves into management, whatever it is, um, when we're in a declining budget environment and we lose somebody, it takes us a year to, year to a two years to get somebody fully qualified. And I'm talking about qualified. I'm not talking about proficient. I'm talking about qualified. And what we need are highly proficient inspectors. And so what does that mean? That means that as people start leaving us, leaving the inspector ranks, we need to, to capture their knowledge before they leave. In sufficient time, we need to hire new people to fill their shoes and give them an opportunity, double encumber in my opinion, to enable knowledge transfer uh, such that the, our overall proficiency doesn't suffer. There was a live polling question on, I forget which session it was, it might have been, I, I can't recall, but, um, but it said, what is your biggest concern about the workforce? And, and I voted technical competency. The others voted external awareness. And I voted technical competency. Why? Because of this issue. Because I'm very concerned that, you know, we are contracting, appropriately so, but up to date, we've not been afforded the opportunity to, um, to, to bring in sufficient number of new folks to fill the shoes of the people who are leaving. And that concerns me greatly. And so I think, um, you know, and I don't mean to speak out of turn here, I agree with being more efficient. I agree with, you know, budgets 
being reduced consistent with the uh, size of the industry. But at the same token, there is a practical implication of that if you push it too far. So I believe we need the latitude to be able to bring in the new folks and train them up before the, the aging folks leave, because otherwise our technical competency and ultimately our credibility as a regulator is going to suffer. Anyone else want to chime in on this topic? Otherwise, I, I do have a pressing you want? Well, I just, I mean, the view from the other side, though, is, it, you know, it doesn't feel like, my, my uh, fees went up 8% this year. That doesn't feel like a declining budget. The, you know, when we look at the number of people, if I go back and compare, you know, prior to the Renaissance, the staff up compared to where our staffing levels are now, I don't think we went back to where we were before, so, um, I would just say within the industry, we're having to find uh, new ways, better ways, more efficient ways to uh, to accomplish our task without sacrificing safety, without sacrificing reliability, but doing it in a way that's less resource intensive. So, uh, you know, I think the fact that the agency's feeling that uh, feeling that pressure as well is not surprising. I just uh, it's. But it is a burden. I mean, it's a regulatory burden on the industry to have fees going up at, at that rate when we're also operating in a, in a declining in a declining budget. Uh, so far, this has been good. You know, we we have found many efficiencies that we've absorbed these costs. But there'll be a point when you know you reach similar to what you're talking about, Scott. You'll reach a you'll reach the line where this is this is exactly what it takes for this day and time to, to yeah. operate this facility safely. And if we can't do it and and uh, still remain financially viable, we'll have to make other decisions. So yeah, I, I would just, you know, I would like to keep the challenge on the table for, for, the, uh, <coughs> for the staff to just you know, stay focused on your mission, but also realize the very real impact that it's having on, on those that, that, you're, uh, that you're overseeing. Preston, that's a good segue to uh, a question that um, was written for you and for Tim, and I'll just read it. Uh, describe your personal messaging to address balancing safety performance relative to financial performance of your operating nuclear fleet. For balancing safety performance versus financial performance, it's a no-brainer. Safety is always number one. It's the key to the game. It's what you have to have to even have a right to be in the game at all. Safety always comes first then financial performance. What you have to find a way to do is be able to operate financially sound manner while maintaining safety above all other things. We, we're having to do the same, but I mean, this is an area that you have, you have to be diligent. Because you can say the words, but if you don't follow through on the actions to demonstrate the value, then you can still, you can find yourself mouthing the phrase, but it not penetrate the organization. So this idea of safety versus cost, we've not, uh, we, we're not, you know, we're not relenting one bit on, on safety. We're not really, you know, while we go after cost. And so far, we've been able to do that. If you look at how our plants operate, they operate, they operate safer now than they, than they have in our history. We're doing it at a cost structure that's better than, than what we've done before. But if I go back to to David, your comment earlier about, uh, you know, if you look, this idea of, you know, oversight in the presence of cost cutting, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's great counsel. In fact, we've, uh, we've put additional teams, oversight teams in place in our organization to uh, uh, independent teams, teams of uh, industry experts to come in and look not only at what we've done, but how we've implemented it and uh, have we done it in a way that's not impacting uh, the safety of the facility. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an ever-present issue. This idea of balancing, and uh, we have to, we have to find, we have to find those opportunities to uh, to highlight where we're going to opt for the safe over the cost. And those opportunities exist. We do it every day. We just we don't advertise them there enough. Just to go back a little bit, real quick, David made a comment earlier about concerns on whether or not we were going to have the right funding to make sure that we're implementing safety related modifications and I can guarantee you that we do get those funds and we've actually gone through and changed our prioritization process to ensure that those projects that impact safety have the highest priorities or the ones that get impacted first. It's the enhancement items, the ones that just make life easier but may not add to the safety. 
that are moved down on the list and aren't implemented. The ones that impact safety are definitely always the first ones that have the highest priority. Okay, we have about nine minutes left, so that's just kind of a warning um, that we're running out of time. But um, we've gotten more than one question um, related to uh, the fact that sometimes NRC struggles with situations in which compliance with a regulatory requirement causes the agency and licensees to focus on issues of lower safety significance. How common is this, and how do you think NRC should address these situations? Uh, maybe start with Kathy on that. And yeah, I'll start from the standpoint of um, um, acknowledging that statement and what is and answering a question of what is NRC doing about that. So most recently, we established a group. Um, it's called the Low Safety Significant Compliance Effort. And this is actually, um, uh, it's being led out of headquarters, but um, my deputy, Laura Dudes, is um, providing uh, leadership to that effort. And the idea here is to, um, can we, from an agency perspective, uh, look to see are there ways that when we identify items that are of the low safety significance that um, we can, uh, I'm gonna use the term resolve them uh, with uh, spending significant NRC resources as well as significantly licensees resources on bringing them to closure. So what this group is gonna do is develop a strategy um, of how we can move forward in this area uh, and it really goes to, uh, it's, it's a, a link to part of the overall agency's effort on doing um, better in the area of risk informing decision making uh, with a mindset of that we do want our resources as well as the licensee's resource focused on the most safety significant items. But yet, um, this would be something going down this approach, this group is a very mind aspect of documenting any decisions that are made so it would be transparent to um, the public as well as to um, industry, any, anyone really wanting to look um, to our inspection reports to see how different issues uh, were resolved. And one of the challenges where I think this does come up, and you, you, um, I guess one of the, the questioner was raising the issue about the frequency that this comes up, and we tend to see this a little bit more on where there's some question on the licensing basis. Um, for example, an inspector is out in the field, identifies something, uh, but then there's the question about is it part of the licensing basis or not. And in the past, you know, way past, if you look at it, significant resources have been expended in looking at does this issue, uh, is it part of the licensing basis? We finally make a decision, you know, yes or no, but let's say yes. Uh, then we go through um, the process and we find out that it was of a very low safety significance. So then even we are asking ourselves, was that worth the time and energy uh, that went into that aspect? Fully recognizing um, what Dave said earlier is if there is a, a problem, we do expect um, that you to the licensees to regain compliance in this area. Now again, there's a little bit of fuzziness, I'll admit there, is if the issue, the root of this is, is it on a licensing basis or not? Because then you could question whether it was a compliance issue or not. So I think the, uh, again, this might be a good question for next year to ask us on where we went with us. This effort is looking at um, really over the next six months uh, to come up with, with a proposal for senior management consideration on how we go forward with this. But the idea is, is true at the end, whichever way we go, you know, there would be um, the final result, whatever the decision make, uh, made would be, is that it would be documented and be available for everyone to see. Preston, do you have any thoughts? Well, on I would just say that, you know, this is one, I mean, it's an important question, and we'll get hung up when we talk about compliance. Uh, I, you know, like Kathy said, I think most of our issues actually come up when there's a question of compliance, and we're interpreting a, a, a licensing basis that may be less than clear, previously accepted. Uh, you know, I've got a plant that's been in service for over 40 years. It, you know, it was issued a license, and then, you know, in an inspection, you know, 42 years later, a question of compliance is raised. You know, once that happens, I think it, it, I think it is right for us to go look and say, if we're just asking a question of compliance, to get to some firm answer, uh, if it's of low safety significance, then why is it worth the investment? Uh, historically, we've had no issues where there is a compliance issue. There's a, there's a rule that says do this, we're outside of uh, 
we're outside of that rule, we take actions to go bring ourselves into compliance. Um, that that becomes a much different uh, a much different problem when you know the very the very basis of which the the plant was either licensed to or designed, and now we got to make a fundamental change that uh, can uh, could really you know, create a decision: Do you continue to operate the facility or not? That's where it's vitally important to bring in these risk perspectives and ask ourselves: You know, is this one to that we got to get to some hard answer on, especially given the 40 years of documentation, what was really meant by a letter that was written in the in the 70s, and you know, what was really said in some meeting where prior to the signature occurring, we just invested, and we have we experienced where we invested way too much uh, time, energy, and dollars into resolving an issue that really didn't make the plan. I, I will tell you, you know, in our case, we we probably did some things that was a step away from safety, trying to keep us in compliance as opposed to moving the plan. Safety. Anyone else have thoughts on this, Dave? Yeah, I think the, the actions the NRC takes to address this issue should include looking at inspection procedure 7115 vacation and resolution procedure. To me, that's the most important procedure the NRC does. It looks at the corrective action programs that the licensees have. I also think it's the least effective procedure inspection that the NRC does. And that gap needs to be closed. It needs to remain important, but may be made more effective. If you look at problems that wandered into columns three and four, a common thread has been a deficient or less than effective corrective action program. In many of those cases, the NRC's P and I R problem identification and resolution inspections gave it good grades up until the point that some event or something moved the plan out. Then all of a sudden it went off a cliff into very bad. You got a very bad it's not that big a gap. It, the perception was too bad early, or too good early, and then too bad later. That P, that inspection needs to more accurately reflect what the condition of the corrective action program is. If you had that confidence, if you had that greater awareness, then it would be easier to, to throw, or not throw, to dismiss low issues of low priority into the corrective action program with confidence that it's going to be addressed in a timely and effective manner. But right now, that procedure is not giving that confidence it, it needs to. Any, Darryl, do you want to chime in? Or just, Darryl might have just been looking my oh. direction. Um, any, other, any other final thoughts on um, how, how we kind of strike the balance or address these issues of, of compliance and the intersection of that with lower safety significance? I would, just, I would just add or offer that um, it is something that the staff uh, struggles with or deals with, I should say, probably. Um, we've had numerous conversations in Region 3 about that. Um, it does get at some of the questions about whether an issue is within the licensee's design bases or not. Uh, but once you get past that point and, and agree that something is a compliance issue or, um, you know, should be fixed or corrected in the corrective action program, that's, I don't believe, something that is of dispute here. Um, I would offer that maybe one of the things that I'm looking, hoping comes out of the effort that uh, Kathy referred to that Laura Dudes is overseeing is for some of the, for us to look at the policy, the enforcement policy, which currently um, tells the staff, you know, how to treat compliance issues and it doesn't, you know, discern between, you know, those that you allow to, you know, um, continue or, or, or don't address in a corrective action uh, perspective. Uh, and those that are above a certain threshold. So I think the enforcement policy ought to be looked at from the standpoint of what does it tell inspectors to do for these low safety significant issues um, and how to dispatch those. And All right, well, I think we should probably wrap it up there. The 90 minutes went quickly. Um, to all of you who submitted questions, thank you very much. We didn't get through every single one, but we did get through most of them. Uh, and hopefully um, the topics that came up addressed your question if we didn't get your individual question. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel for this discussion. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.